Hello, everyone. So earlier today, we actually talked a little bit about convolutional neural networks in one of the talks, where we were sorting apples left and right by the different features that it had. So um, it, it's actually not a surprise anymore for you that we can do deep learning in Java. Uh, here, I'm actually going to share with you a library that is trying to compete with TensorFlow, even though that real-world implications actually show that it's still not there yet. But to get it there, it's actually up to us to, because it's open source, it's up to us to optimize, to, uh, to deliver, to just get it to the uh, good old Python level. So who am I? I'm a Java developer, like most of you. I love Kotlin. I actually started working with Kotlin and not Java. Uh, I'm a security enthusiast. Uh, Loved the previous talk, it was amazing. Like, it sounds basic, but a lot of people, and the statistics actually show that a lot of people don't think about basic security. And I actually had the chance to work into application security with uh, OAuth to Active Directory and SAML. I had the chance to implement a Kotlin uh, library for, uh, on the Google App Engine. Basically, it was implementation to plug in with Google App Engine. Uh, I've mostly developed with microservices. I've actually never had the chance to work in a monolith. Uh, every time in AWS, Google App Engine, stuff like that. Uh, I actually had the chance to uh, work with gRPC, which is uh, coming back along. Like, I, I thought that people are going to forget that, and it's actually coming back. Kafka pops up. Uh, regular things for, for everyone. I love playing board games and love flying with my drone uh, on, from bird's eye view. So uh, before we start with the agenda, I just want to say that I'm not in any way or sort a uh, deep learning specialist. I, like you, uh, saw the amazing development in the AI, AI world. I saw that those uh, convolutional neural networks, those image recognition uh, AIs develop into self-driving cars. I saw those robots that were barely walking left and right. They were tumbling everywhere. They started running uh, obstacle courses. They started uh, dancing uh, synchronously with, with one another. Um, th there have been uh, many implementations, of course, ChatGPT. And uh, I remember last year, uh, Nadine was very pushy. No, no not pushy. but. He was um, telling everybody to start using Google Copilot, and it has been an amazing conclusion. Uh, so I'm, I got very interested to understand what's happening behind the scenes. I wanted to understand how these neural networks actually learn, how they self-develop. Because th th that's what everyone's saying, that they learn. You feed the data, they learn. You feed the data, more data, more data. So I. I kind of went into a deep dive into the basics, of course, because it's uh, such a giant topic that 40 minutes are not even remotely close to, to be able to, to grasp it. So to understand the basics, I think my, my appeal here is uh, to show you the basics, to show you a little bit about what we can do in, DL, uh, in the Java world with DL4J, uh, how TensorFlow actually can be pluggable in, with DL4J as well, and to appeal to you to actually have this basic and be ready to explore more and to, uh, to, to try it and not turn into the dark side with Python. So uh, yeah, uh, coming back to the agenda, we're going to uh, talk about neural networks. We're going to deep dive in deep learning, what kind of uh, models they are. We're going to talk about asking the right questions, because that's very important when training a model. We're going to talk, about, of course, about DL4J. Uh, a little look into the Python world. Of course, we need to know what the other side's doing. I'm going to show you a demo of the most basic Hello World application for deep learning, which is using the MNIST data sets of written numbers to identify what number is written and to put out what probability that that number is, which that number is. So what are neural networks? Since the dawn of time, 
uh, neural networks, since the dawn time, we have been very interested in playing God. We have been very interested in creating something that's in our image. We have literature, literature like Frankenstein's monster or the golem. And, uh, of course, the previously mentioned implication that we try to mimic how we are thinking. So it's only uh, understandable that we call these models neural networks. They're neural networks because that's what we call the, the connections in the brain. And uh, the basic building blocks of neural networks are actually neurons. When you think of neurons, you should actually think of it as a computational unit. It takes some inputs, sometimes from outside sources, sometimes it takes them from uh, other neurons from different levels, and adds some weights and biases, and we're going to talk what weights and biases actually are, to compute and send data to the next level, to the next layer. We're going to talk about layers uh, again in a minute. What are weights? So, weights actually mean What's the significance of the data? What's the significance of the features that the input data has? Because let's say we want to identify cats. We want to have a neural network that's going to identify images of cats. So we need to think of features that distinguish a cat from a dog, so, or, or from other animals as well. So basically, we want to have fur. We want to have four paws. We want to have... Uh, cute eyes, stuff like that. And in essence, things that have those um, features would actually have higher weights in our input than things that don't have them. And I'm going to leave biases for a later time, because after we calculate all of those weights from the data, we actually, the neuron actually passes that to an activation function. Activation functions will decide, based on calculation of the weights and of the biases, whether or not the neuron needs to fire up, whether or not it needs to propagate more data to the next level. And we're going to talk about biases here. Basically, what biases are, those are little nuances that tip the scales left and right for the weights, identifying, um, basically, Look at them as, hey, yeah, it has four, uh, four paws, but even if it has three paws, it still can be a cat. So that thing can still be, uh, can still fire for the next level. And biases give us the ability to, uh, for the neurons to actually uh, form very complex relations and to have variations where only the weights are, uh, because the weights are not enough for that. So. After everything is calculated, and how they are calculated, basically imagine, I didn't want to bore you with linear algebra, but it's actually big matrices that calculate the weights from each and every neuron or data that comes for, uh, as an input, applies the biases, and then it, has, uh, it runs it through an activation function, which is usually sigmoid, relu, uh, hyperbolic tangents. It's, I don't want to even go into um, details there, but it's basically trying to calculate whether or not the given data is enough for the neuron to fire for the next level, for the next layer. And so basically we have three kinds of layers. The input layer, a couple of hidden layers in the middle, and output layer. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically the input layer, as we mentioned, the neurons can receive data from outside sources, from raw data, from, uh, from different kinds of label data or unlabeled. It depends what kind of training you want to do. But that's the basic. It, it can even, the input layer can even serve as a daisy chain for a different uh, neural, neural network. You can actually use data that comes out from the output layer of, a diff of different neural networks and feed them into this, into our neural network. So, why are the middle layers called hidden layers? Well, actually, in the past, a lot of people that were building neural networks were fine-tuning those weights and biases themselves. So, basically, imagine them as little knobs that you can turn left and right 
And that's, of course, that's going to produce a difference in the way the output layer is going to receive the data or every other layer afterwards uh, from, let's say, hidden layer one to hidden layer two. And these knobs were usually, usually people would um, turn them themselves. Nowadays, with um, backwards propagation, with gradient descent, uh, actually the neural networks are learning themselves. And there are different uh, strategies implement implemented to, uh, to, to, to help the neural network to, to better itself. And how do we identify that the neural network actually made a mistake? Well, we feed the data. But that data actually needs to, we, we, we need some sort of a way to identify that the predicted outcome of the neural network was actually within a range, within an acceptable range for us. What that means is if we uh, have, coming back to that neural network that's um, trying to identify different breeds of cats, let's say, uh, if we have a main coon and our cost function is going to take the prediction of our neural network and compare it to the output image that we're expecting, and say, like, let's say our neural network has a 0.7 probability that this is a main coon. So our cost function or our loss function would mean that we have a 0.3 error in our network. So using cost function actually helps us to identify what kind of an error our neural network produces. And this way we can calculate with the back propagation and with gradient descent which knobs to turn. And the neural network actually does it itself again with linear algebra using the gradient descent. But we're going to talk about that in a minute. Come on, connection. So what is deep learning? Well, basically neural networks, that's better themselves. They are using, there are many ways for neural networks to better themselves because like, you have differences in, uh, as convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. We're going to touch base on that in a minute. But in essence, deep learning is neural networks that better themselves. So just a step backwards and to talk about representation learning and what that is. And I've taken a screenshot from, uh, from TensorFlow's Playground, where you can actually set up quickly. I'm going to show you that in a minute. To set up quickly some different inputs, some different features that you want to look, about, uh, look for, the kind of task, I didn't include it in the screenshot, but the kind of task you're trying to, to solve. And you can actually leave it, uh, you can set up the activation function, stuff like that. You can leave it to, um, to visualize how the neural network is actually um, working. So representational learning is actually the neural network trying to identify features in the data and make connections between them. It's trying to make a hierarchical, hierarchical connection between the data, which, which is more important, which is less important, hence the weights. And it's actually trying to learn by organizing the data. So this is what a deep neural network will actually look like. And if we, I was having an idea about a, um, an idea of a game so that we can visualize it more. But if we visualize this whole conference room, like this is some sort of a neural network. We have the, uh, the doors, which are the entrance, which are the, the input of the neural network. And each one of you, which, each row, represents some neurons. And if people from the, fr fr from the back just tap you on the shoulder and tell you, hey, uh, I actually know about this news, and you decide if that news is actually important for you, you can, you can tell it to the next layer. And it's up to you to understand if the, if the news is important and, and propagate it forward. So this is what happens. So some of the neurons would actually be responsible for activating the neurons on the next level. Uh, hence the, the, the yellowish uh, lighting on those neurons. So what is backpropagation then? Backpropagation in three words is just retracing your steps. Understanding what uh, made you come here, and, and, and I mean retracing your steps because in the world of neurons, not all neurons are equal uh, given uh, an output. 
uh, in this case, these, neuron, these three neurons had no implication to activate the end result. So when we want to apply a gradient descent optimization, we actually need to further up and down the weights and biases for these neurons. These neurons have higher weight in our system. These neurons are actually more important to, to the end result. The other ones, uh, let's say that actually with the cost function, this neuron was pretty close to activating. Well, we don't want that. We don't want some random data that actually comes over that, uh, um, that limit to actually activate this neuron. So this is where we actually need to lower the weights and the biases. This is where we need to make, it better, uh, make our system better predict that this is not it. This is not the, the desired outcome. So, it's very important to have good data pre preparation. Uh, there are a couple of um, mentioned uh, approaches, and these are data cleaning, which from its name, you can, you can actually imagine what it is. It's just handling nulls, handling missing data, handling um, some noise in our data, which we can identify whether or not we want to uh, denoisify or even exclude from our data so that our uh, network can more easily train itself. And we shouldn't forget that networks can, can be a starting point for other networks. So it, it's not a problem to, to teach our networks with lower data sets or higher data sets just to experiment what, what is best. And to experiment, you need to experiment with different activation functions and loss functions as well, which is, which is the interesting part of deep learning for me. Data normalization, like everything, we need to have normalized data. We need to, that data need to be scaled properly. We cannot have uh, like pictures that are uh, very big uh, against small pictures and um, stuff that are concentrated on uh, just the hand of something and not the whole picture. So we need to have our data normalized. We also need to have feature encoding. So what is feature encoding? This means that so we did say that we're going to look for some features. Well, for our, in order for our neural network to properly train itself, it needs to have it, the, these features encoded into a numeric value. It needs to, to have it in a way it can understand it. Then we have feature scaling, which is a step further. So let's say we're, the, the demo today, as I said, is going to be uh, identified from the MNIST uh, data set, uh, what the written number is. And it's, the, the neural network is going to train itself. So in that scenario, we're trying to ident identify in a grid of 28 20 to 28, which pixels are lit. We don't need from 0 to uh, 255 uh, data for those pixels. We, we need something smaller, like 0 to 1. We need to know what the, the, that this uh, pixel is actually lit, so it's something closer to 0 0.8 and, and above, or even 1 would be the best, the best case. So we need to scale our data into an understandable or more easily computable um, values for our um, data set. We also need to have data splitting. Basically, uh, and th th that's not always. You, you don't always need to have data splitting because sometimes you can have an unsupervised well link. But we need to have test data, we need to have validation data, and we need to have input data. So input data comes into our system. The uh, deep learning uh, neural network self-trains. We do that with the validation, input vi uh, versus validation, cost function, yada, yada, yada. But then we need to have the test data. After we have tested everything, we have taught, or it, it has self-learned, the neural network has self-learned, we need to actually see how it's performing. So we need to feed the data that it has never seen. Just a newly written three, a newly written four. Something that we need to see that, hey, okay, you're working well with that data. Let's see how you're doing with the, with the new one. And uh, again, the last one as well is not always needed. Sequential preparations or sequence preparation. Uh, for uh, recurrent neural networks, we actually need to prepare the data to add timestamps or um, which ones after which, so that, for instance, when our neural network is, uh, has taught itself, 
it doesn't say I am a it says I am a speaker and not something that Yoda would say like speaker am I, something like that. So we need to have sequential data prepared and sometimes in timely manner as well. So unsupervised learning, well, almost what I would just said, just don't do it. Give your neural network just large data sets of data. Uh, which are not labeled, which do not have expected outcome. This approach actually gives us, or gives the neural network the ability to look for similar features, to look for things that uh, actually matter, and it, it's the thing that it, it actually identifies. After you have something that uses some supervised learning, you can actually uh, use generative models which uh, can generate data that's similar to the input data. And that's why like, we have uh, stuff like ChatGPT that can generate data from everything that it was fed. And of course, it tries to generate it as close as possible to the original thing. Uh, image, image construction, some, some of the things that you're trying to, uh, let's say you have an app that gives you a uh, anime face. Oh, well, that actually, it's, it's very simple. It hasn't learned to add an anime filter to your face. It adds some noise to your face and it tries to reconstruct it using, uh, using uh, algorithms. So, what are convolutional neural networks? We've all heard of them. Though these are the image recognition neural networks. These are the, the, these are the object recognition neural networks. These are our self-driving cars. Convolutional neural networks basically work by having convolutional layers, which you stack a lot of, many convolutional layers, and like the more you have, the, 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 usually they say the better they are. Again, not an expert, I might be talking gibberish. But yeah, like you have your AlexNet, VGGNet, some of the uh, you only look ones, FaceNet, uh, those are things that we actually fed a couple of years back when Facebook asked us to. Give it a lot of picks. Deep lesion and UNET. The other ones, as we, please, as we mentioned, are the recurrent neural networks. Those keep, uh, the way I understood them, are they, they have memory inside of them. They have uh, temporal memory and also distance memory, which, which things are connected and which are not. These are, um, these are the NLP models that we've actually started learning um, in our free time. Uh, these are group, deep speech. Uh, these things can actually, um, with MuseNet, they can even generate music. Like imagine that, just, I, I want like this and like this, and you just feed it words and actually generate tunes for you. Uh, Google Natural Machine Translation. We have things like Google Copilot that can generate code from uh, natural language. It's, it's just an amazing thing. And I really uh, urge you to, to explore more and to look into the different implementation and the different models. Okay, my battery might be dying. So we touched base a little bit earlier about GPU acceleration and why are GPUs so good at this? Well, they have actually been optimized for large matrix, uh, matrix uh, calculations. And if we go back to the, uh, neural, the, the neural network, or our neural network right now, imagine that each and every one of you would actually receive information from everyone, usually from everyone, from the previous layer, from the previous row, in our case. Well, that's a lot of things to add. That, that's the information, that's the weights, that's the bias. It's like we, we, we get matrices with thousands and, and thousands of uh, different variables inside of them. And GPUs have actually been very good and always have been very good to calculate giant matrices. And of course, floating point calculations as well, which are the basics of neural network calculation. And that's why usually like you have the, the CUDA cores that we mentioned earlier today with, uh, with the earlier talk. Uh, NVIDIA has, uh, has developed that. Funny, funny enough, I couldn't run a GPU acceleration on the M1 chip. Maybe that's my fault, but it was, it was more hustle than, um, 
positive. So I decided just to leave my demo without a GPU acceleration. So asking the right questions to train a deep learning or to let it train, we need to have some, uh, as we said, we need to have some boundaries. We need to have a predicted outcome, and that outcome needs to be something that we want. So I want to show you something very interesting, at least for me. I saw it in a lecture from Harvard, and this is a game named Coastal Runners. Basically, as any other racing game, this is a free game, you can download it now if you want, like any other uh, racing game, you go around uh, uh, some laps, you try to finish first, you have some green tubules there that you can collect for extra points, and at the end of the game, uh, it actually calculates where you were as a position, how much time it takes, and how many green tubules you gathered. So somebody decided to play with it and try to make a, um, a neural network play the game. And this is how the neural network plays the game. So pretty normal stuff. Goes for some green things. Actually, it's only going to go for green things. Our neural network decided that this is the best approach. This is the best way. You don't even have to finish. You just need to gather those three tubules to have the best score. So this is something that we didn't want. Like imagine shipping this to, to the end user with your game, and you, you see half the AIs playing over there, and you're like, what the hell is happening? So I want to touch base on a couple of other uh, different scenarios that I read about, which were very interesting. There was an experiment to do a a uh, robot that, uh, an android, if you may, uh, that works in a warehouse. It comes in, grabs the package, goes over there, puts the package. Comes in, grabs the package, goes over there, puts the package. Well, actually, our network decided that the packages that are in front of it have zero significance to its task. So it actually started kicking them, flinging them all around the place. Well, we did tell it to just move packages. Uh, the optimization is kicking, so I guess, okay. Uh, something else that happened, maybe you remember it, a couple years back, we had an AI that started swearing. It started just doing racial slurs in different uh, derogatory language, and that's, that's unexpected. That's something that we don't want. What's happening there? Well, we're talking about unexpected consequences. Sometimes our neural networks are actually susceptible to attacks. Those attacks include feeding it wrong data. Most of the neural networks that are out there, you, they're probably defended now. I, I'm, I'm actually hoping because some of us maybe use it to generate small snippets of code. Like imagine if somebody tells you that the snippets of code need to be generated completely differently. Oh, usually tests should catch that, hopefully. But yeah, we can talk about unexpected consequences. The final example that I want to share with you is something that happened with some of the convolutional neural networks and with the self-driving cars. There was actually a patch, and I don't know if it wasn't uh, disclaimed if it was Tesla or uh, NVIDIA's uh, implementation, but there was actually a, pa um, a problem where a stop sign with some added anxiety data, that's what they called it, anxiety data. So that's data that basically brings little uncertainties for the AI that make it want to, to predict wrong data. Well, actually, they had a big stop sign. They added all those anxiety factors to the stop sign, and the stop sign actually identified it as a uh, speed limit. The car didn't stop at the stop sign. It just com completely continued over there. It was, in, of course, in a test environment, so that wasn't a problem. But it's actually possible to uh, very, usually very easily, uh, trick the neural networks with wrong data or with, uh, as we saw earlier, with not um, well-prepared um, objectives. And that's why even though neural networks in, in their base are trying to be Mm, to, to eliminate the human factor into all of that, um, into the whole data preparation, data um, 
data connection, we still have to have a, sup a human supervisor. We still need to have a person at the end that is responsible for checking and validating that the data is actually, th that the outcome is actually what we wanted. And in the case of uh, ChatGPT generating your code or um, let's say Copilot ge generating your code, I'm not against it. I'm very much with it. But we all need to make sure that the code is actually something that makes sense, something that's optimized, because those things are still not um, very well prepared for production implications. Uh, for instance, if you tell it to generate a loop, it's always going to use the basic four. It's never like if you want to have a stream, you need to have, oh, yeah, I wanted a stream. I didn't want a loop. So you, you need to, to make sure that the data created is always, or, or the outcome created is what you want. So, the O4J. Actually, I think it was 2017. I don't have my presentation notes right now. Uh, I think it came out 2017 from Eclipse. And it has been being added to different projects in the meantime, but Right now, right here, you can download that and um, play with it. You can actually have, it supports most of the neural network architecture that we talked about. It supports, supports GPU acceleration. It has multi-layer perception for cognitive neural networks. As I said, CNNs, RNNs, it has transfer learning. So basically, while we touched base a little bit earlier, something that's able to start from a checkpoint, if you will, of another neural network. It, you can actually uh, have model imports and exports. What that means is TensorFlow has an amazing giant um, neural zoo, as the way they call it. So you can actually import Python, already Python trained neural networks to your own DL4J code. Uh, it has distributed computing and, of course, natural language processing, which is in the top one, but I just wanted to mention it separately. So what it doesn't have, and that's yet, some of these are loosely supported, they have the basic functionality, but still, as I said, it's, you, we need to work to, to improve it. Uh, it, it doesn't have advanced pre-processing of data, it doesn't have the model zoo, it doesn't have everything that's, of course, as I said, you can import it, but it doesn't have it uh, created as, as Java things. It doesn't have automated hyperparameter tuning, which is uh, an even better way to improve your own neural network. It doesn't, it supports reinforcement learning, but it's not, it's just the basic algorithms. It doesn't have the things like TensorFlow has, uh, it doesn't have automatic differenti differenti excuse me, and ecosystem and community. Uh, I don't know, I learned about the O4J a couple of months ago. I don't know about you, but it's not that common for people to know about it. So why Python? Well, as we said, TensorFlow, the de facto standard, PyTorch from Facebook, Keras on top of that, Keras just, uh, is a more abstract um, layer on top of TensorFlow and PyTorch. And I am not even mentioning the, the five other results that I got on, um, as a result on searching what Python has. It's extensive, it, it, it's optimized. But that doesn't mean that Java can't get there, or at least in a close margin. So before we get to the demo, I promised you guys that I'm going to show you the TensorFlow playground. And here you can actually play with different tasks, with different features, with different inputs. Like you can add noise to your data. You can have, you, you can reprocess what the batch size is going to be. Different, um, as I said, features that you're looking for. Something interesting that I found, uh, let's not use Tang. I mentioned that the activation functions usually uh, were sigmoid and relu. 
Actually, relu is the thing that uh, completely, not, not changes, but like, I guess, puts uh, sigmoid into, um, it just it just completely replaced it. Because, for instance, for sigmoid, if you have this basic task, uh, excuse my French, Let me just reload it because we're not having any. And they're promising that you can't break it. And of course, it's each and every demo. I wanted to show you a classification task and how sigmoid is so much slower than relu. But for some reason, maybe messing up with the batch size was actually a problem. Yep. All right, so sigmoid right now is trying to build a function that's going to separate them. Like, you saw that it took some time. Let's, let's do it again, like at around Come on now. I want you to work with what, with what I gave you. So around 665 is what took sigmoid. So choosing the correct activation function actually has a big difference. Like this, is, this took like six times faster to, to generate the, the usual, it, it's not correct, it's not perfect because we have noise in our data. So if you leave it for a couple more minutes, it's actually going to go ahead and try to draw a line between these. It's going to try to exclude this. But like, it took six times more to, uh, six, six times faster to uh, do this graph with ReLU instead of Sigmoid. So it's very important to actually identify what kind of an activation function you want to have to, uh, to, to have better results. And you're not limited to a single activation function for your whole neural network. You can actually have different activation functions for different layers. Because, and again, I'm saying you can play with it. There's probably like concrete world data, which one's better, which one's not. But I'm going to leave that to you to, to find out. So, as I said, and I'm not going to write that in front of you, it's just, it's just such a small demo, but it's the hello world of the um, deep learning or neural network for image recognition. Ah, uh, this is not good. Like this? Is it better? Let me just close this. So, as I said, we're going to have 28 pixels by 28. It's not pixels, but our separation of data is going to be 28 by 28. Um, of output number of 10, we're going to try to identify 0 to 9. Uh, we're going to have the batch size, uh, some RNG C10, how many iterations we want to have our neural network train itself uh, while it's doing that. We load the MNIST data set, uh, we train and test, uh, just a random seed, and we start to set up our neural networks. Everyone's favorite builders, you have a multi-layer configuration which, of course, again, it's with the random RNG seed. It's not a random seed, it's the RNG seed. Uh, you have the, um, an optimization um, algorithm, which, uh, in this case, we're using the, a gradient descent. Uh, a gradient normalization, uh, some different things, some different knobs that you can turn. The uh, first layer that we're going to create is going to use ReLU and wait in it with Savior. And the output layer is going to actually limit itself with softmax and try again Savior. Back, back propagation type standard, we don't want anything fancy. This is again just the hello world. If you tell ChatGPT to generate something for you, it's going to be this. I promise. Uh, without the S out. So if we run this thing, Something interesting that we did, that I did, is that this thing initially took like four minutes. 
and was coming out with something like 0.92 precision, which is not bad, but it took four minutes. So we um, lowered the number of um, epochs, we lowered the number of um, ins and outs. I just wanted it to mimic the way that I built the Python uh, counterpart. And this thing actually runs for anything in the ballpark of a minute. So for a minute, we're going to have some data here, and we're going to get a confusion matrix. I'm not going to go ahead and make you write a number, yada, yada, yada. We're going to have a confusion matrix, which is very good, a very good representation on how our uh, neural network actually um, performed. It's going to show us how many times it made an error for the one, for the twos, for the trees. We're going to visualize um, how much our um, model, uh, how good it is or bad. Of course, it's not going to take a minute in front of you guys. I promise you it was a minute. Okay, let's go to the Python side while we wait for it to finish. Pretty similar stuff. We try to have the same activation function. We, oh, sorry, this is the, so we still use ReLU, we still use Softmax. We still have a density of 28 by 28 with 128 connections. Uh, we have 10 epochs. The batch size is a little bit bigger, but it's not, it, it's a little bit different. Uh, so, this is how much time Python with TensorFlow takes. Let me just close this. Let's terminate it. We'll just have a clean slate and just run it. So it's still compiling, it's still initializing first epoch, second epoch, third epoch. And you can see the accuracy is very high. Of course, this is using TensorFlow. Oh, there we go. It's actually predicted that seven is an actual seven. So this took something in the ballpark of 10 seconds, right? I don't have the S out here, the print line but it has a test accuracy of 0 0.9. How did our, our friend in the O4J do? 84 seconds, and the matrix is very random. We have a lot of things happening with the eights, a lot of things happening with the one. Like you can see, there are a lot of places where it sh where it, where, when it was guessing and it should have been. So I actually have one of my slides where I printed a matrix for Java. Again, 10 iterations, accuracy 0 0.86. And if you leave it to train a little bit more, it gets better. As I said, it gets to 90 something, but four minutes instead of the like, this is 105 seconds this time. Like this one actually trained better. The Python one is quite better. It, with almost no mistakes. Like again, the, the different uh, numbers represent, like the first one is uh, the one, the second one is the two, three, like the four uh, actually had some problems here as we can see, where's my pointer? Like we had some problems with the four with the six, uh, with the seven, it tried it to be a six. So Python is doing very well and a lot faster. Like after the first iteration, like after the second iteration, it did almost like we had a giant optimization here and the other ones just were just slight iterations over it and made it a little bit better. So, some time for questions and answers, and I just want to say, again, I'm not a deep learning expert. I'm here to just try and spark some... Uh, I'm trying to make you guys understand that 
we have it in the Java world. We need to work together to make it into a state that's optimized enough to, to try and be, um, to try and work with, uh, with Python. But even if we don't optimize it, we, ha we can use already Python pre-trained models and just prototype, prototypize, have prototypes easily in a language that you already know. Questions, anyone? Mitya. Thank you. Oh, you had a, we have a microphone here. Good. Thanks. Is the Java model running on GPUs? Probably not, right? Sorry? The Java mod, the Java's probably not running on GPUs, I would imagine. No, it actually it is. Is it? It works okay. with GPU acceleration. I couldn't get it to work on, on Mac. It actually has an okay. M2 release. So it is possible, it's just my incompetence. And the Python, does that run on GPUs on your Mac? Uh, the Python TensorFlow works with GPUs. Yeah, yeah. It has GPU acceleration, yeah. definitely. So, so is, is that perhaps one of the reasons? No, the still is? same, like uh, CUDA cores are on NVIDIA, so not on A1. No, that's not the reason. Okay, that's these are the both reason. with CPU setting. So okay, these are both right. using a CPU. Uh, calculation instead of GPU. GPU acceleration is not acceleration. It's basically giving hardware that's optimized to do that. Sure. And these are both using CPU. So that's definitely, I, I, I tested it and it's, it's, using, it's not using the CUDA cores. And the second follow-up question is with Project Panama, we should be able to interface with, with native libraries more easily, I think. So is that Project Panama, I think? No. But what is that called? I think Project Panama, isn't it, the uh, improvement of a JNI? So will we be able to possibly improve the performance by using more la native libraries from within Java? Well, I think in, in its core, we need to optimize the, the different models and the, the way they're being calculated. Because it's linear algebra at the end of the day, as we said. So if we manage to optimize the performance of the calculations, in the Java environment, then yeah, we'll be able to. I'm not sure that I'm qualified enough to tell you in one year we're going to be better than Python, and I don't even think that we will be. But I do know that we can do it. We can not, not be better, but we can do almost everything with DL4J and not have to relearn Python. We can even use TensorFlow, as our colleague showed. Uh, it has a layer that gives you the ability to, to use TensorFlow as well. So it's quite okay to work with both worlds. Okay, we have one more minute for questions. Somebody? Okay. Thank Good. you. No more Thank questions. You for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.